Paul's continuing to hammer away in love. <laughs> but some uh, serious, serious doctrine that we're getting into. Somebody once said Galatians is like an abbreviated or more brief version of the book of Romans. Um, and the book of Romans is just a longer, kind of uh, drawn out a little bit more, but so much doctrine. And it's really true that Galatians uh, doesn't pull any punches. It doesn't beat around the bush. It just gets down to what Paul's getting across. And his audience uh, in Galatia, remember, was it's a region. It's not like a church of Galatia necessarily, but churches in the first chapter. Um, they were churches in a whole region. So we might say the churches in Sonoma County, kind of like that. Whereas uh, Philippians or Colossians or Corinthians, like we were just in, uh, that was addressed to one specific church in one specific region. This is the church's plural, and I think that's worth noting because all of us need to hear it. Not that the stuff in Corinthians wasn't applicable, which obviously there was a lot in there for us, but I think this is overall um, the doctrines that we should adhere to, the, the uh, general views. And, and so it doesn't get as specific as it was in Corinthians. And I think it's worth noting that. Um, but I have to read my favorite verse again, Galatians 2.20, because this says it all. And in, in a typical uh, Calvary Chapel fashion, you never want to just start a new chapter. You want to make sure you know what's before it, what we were talking about last week, get refreshed in our mind. And the the title last week was Law and Grace, and that kind of sums up what we were talking about and what chapter 2 really went over. But summing it up in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, very clear. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. And I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ died for nothing. Christ is dead in vain. O foolish Galatians, verse 1 of chapter 3, who has bewitched you, or what kind of spell are you under, that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or was it by the hearing of faith? Or are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh. Have you suffered so many things in vain? If it be yet in vain, he therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So, the rhetorical questions that he asks before he gets into the history lesson. <laughs> just verses 1 through 5, again, talking about the law. And whereas before we talked about the law and grace last week and in chapter 2, that was kind of a theme through Galatians chapter 2. But here in Galatians chapter 3, we're going to see it's not necessarily the law and grace, but the law and the Spirit. Um, and starting out in the Spirit... Having, can you be made perfect in the flesh or by the flesh? The answer, obviously, is a resounding no. It's an impossibility. Um, but the reason I read Galatians 2.20 to go right along with this is we've died to our own flesh. 
And there's the rub. There's the connection between chapters 2 and chapter 3, I think. And that is, how do you keep the law if you're going to try? It's by the works of the flesh. I just won't do it. <laughs> and you uh, are determined not to do it, and you've made up your mind, and you're going you're gonna to prove to God that you're a good little boy. Or a good little girl. Either way. And when you understand it has nothing to do with how well I can do. It has nothing to do with my flesh and what I'm able to present to God. In fact, the best I could come up with would be an offense. And that's what he's getting at. That's what the whole purpose of the book of Galatians is, is to teach you. And, and in context, in the context, what Paul uh, has already addressed in, in some ways, is if you want to keep the Sabbath day and start to do that, that's all right, that's fine. But don't think that that does anything in the sight of God as far as giving you good points with God, keeping the Sabbath day. Or for uh, them, the other big thing that came up was if you want to get circumcised as a man. A lot of good health reasons to do that. But don't think that that is going to win points or give you some kind of acceptance with God. And the whole point of circumcision was to show them the cutting away of the flesh, that it's not a work of the flesh. And we can fall into the same categories thinking that because we do this or do that, that we somehow can be accepted in a better sense. Uh, it makes absolutely no difference. We are all sinners. And there is one way to be saved. It's by grace. It's, it really is a work of the Spirit, not a work of man. If, if uh, John chapter 3 teaches us anything, the, probably the most famous verse in the world comes out of John chapter 3, verse 16, right? God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son... Whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. God, uh, Jesus, before getting to that point, talked about the Spirit. He talked about being born of the Spirit. In fact, the very term that maybe you've heard, born again, comes from John chapter 3. A man must be born again. Otherwise, you cannot get into heaven. Jesus did not say a man must be circumcised. Or a man must... Keep the Sabbath day holy. Or a man has to bring sacrifices by this, you know, and, and uh, observe all of the law, all of the Ten Commandments, and everything up there, everything that they had in their history. And the person he's talking to in John chapter 3 was a teacher of the law. He knew the Ten Commandments well. He knew all of that. Um, and Jesus was appalled. Jesus was amazed and really was kind of like, you're teaching people about the law and you have no idea what the Spirit is? <laughs> um, and people can be brought up in church. They can be taught the Ten Commandments. They can start to think they need to keep those things. And you could, you could read through this book and it's totally a dead kind of ritual, just a text that you're reading without the Spirit. The Spirit makes it alive. The Spirit gives life. The law, the letter of the law, kills. It destroys. It makes us frustrated <laughs> as in the flesh. Because there's no way I can keep it. There's no way we can keep it. So do we just discard? Do we just do away with? No. Because I would not know the beauty of the Spirit. I would not know the incredible grace of God if it weren't for Leviticus, the law. If it weren't for what we're studying through currently. And I, it's God's Holy Spirit coincidence, if I'll use that phrase carefully, 
It's God's Holy Spirit by His divine appointment that we happen to be in Galatians as we're going through Leviticus on Sunday mornings. Because you read through Leviticus and you start to think, hey, maybe we should get back to some of these. These laws and keeping the law. It's a, it's a uh, reaction, it's a desire of our flesh to want there to be rules that we can follow. And that makes me a good man, a good woman before God. That on that day I can, you know, put before Him all of my church attendance, all of the money I gave to church over the years. I can lay that out and somehow that's going to that's gonna do anything. Galatians is going to knock and pop that bubble pretty clear. Um, that's what I love about the book of Galatians. The answer, again, is absolutely not. Uh, we, we do not be, uh, verse 3, we, we are not made perfect by the flesh. And that I, the idea is, are you growing? Are you being ma made mature? Because none of us will ever arrive at perfection, but it's never going to be a work of the flesh. So verse 6 now, I love Paul for this. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the Gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. That would have blown their minds. The Jews of, this, of the time that Paul is writing this, they never thought that all nations could come to God. In fact, that was, to, in their eyes, blaspheme. That was, that was something to be forbidden, something that was unheard of. This was a whole new revelation, a whole new uh, thing that was happening. And Paul was was the uh, forerunner of it. So this these things were all preached and, and shown through Abraham. In thee shall all nations be blessed, not just Israel, not just Galatia, <laughs> not just certain regions, but all nations shall be blessed. Verse 9, So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Again, this is the book of Galatians addressing the shall live part. And if you weren't here last last week, um, I'll fill you in. Because there's a, an incredible trilogy uh, written about that very saying, which comes from the book of Habakkuk 2.4. And that is where you see in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, you first find that phrase, the just shall live by faith. But in Romans, that book, that uh, verse is quoted. Here in Galatians, it's quoted, but it's going to be qu quoted again in the book of Hebrews. And the two words, you can take the just, and that sums up the book of Romans. You can take shall live, and we're going to see how this sums up the book of Galatians. By faith, the book of Hebrews gets into. So you can kind of chop those up into those three uh, and it's really a neat trilogy as you uh, study through that. And the law is not of faith, but the man that does them shall live in them. Speaking of shall live, right? Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. 
And he goes on about Abraham. Verse 15, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or adds thereto. No one can take away or do away with it or add to it. Now to Abraham, verse 16, and his seed were the promise promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, or plural, but as of one, singular, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of no effect. The law does not outweigh the promise. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of a promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serves the law? Why does the law exist? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could, uh, could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by, uh, by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that keep the law. No, it doesn't say that, does it? At the end of verse 22. The promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. That's a key. That You might highlight that. That is a key for you and I. But before faith came, verse 23, we were kept under the law. Shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. And here's a key verse to get to know. Therefore, the law was our schoolmaster, or literally a tutor, to bring us to Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that, faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Jesus Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and their um, heirs according to the promise. So there you have it. The history lesson by Paul. Getting And what was interesting, what is interesting, is that the Pharisees, and even Paul would have known, they always went to Moses. They looked to Moses. Even when they talked to Jesus and tried to convince followers of Jesus to keep the law, they went to Moses. And it's interesting here, Paul goes to Abraham, who lived long, long before Moses came onto the scene. In fact, Moses just wrote down the law. God used him as an instrument to write down the law. Abraham showed us what friendship with God is, not some legal binding contract, but rather a relationship or friendship. In fact, Abraham is called, the scripture calls him a friend of God. I thank God that, that the scripture calls him that because if Abraham can be his friend, there's hope for all of us. <laughs> and here's an even funner fact, even funner to do is when did Abraham Except and, and when was it said of Abraham that he believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness? Was it when Abraham was a Jew or not? No. Abraham was a Gentile. This is why the Pharisees would point to Moses so often. This is why they would they steered 
stayed away from this whole issue because the, the fact of the matter is God called a Gentile out of the Ur of Chaldees and brought him in and made him righteous long before Genesis 17, I think it's chapter 17, where Abraham goes through the circumcision, the rite of circumcision. God makes him do that and makes him a Jew. And, and, and he becomes the father of the nation. But it's interesting, and the Holy Spirit kind of goes out of his way to make sure that he's accounted righteous in God's sight long before any of the law is ever written. Um, and all it says is Abraham was accounted righteousness because he believed God. And that's why it's so key for you and I to, to really highlight <laughs> that um, verse 22, as we read, that the promise, the same promise that was given to Abraham long ago that comes by Jesus Christ, it is given to you, it is given to me, it's given to anyone who believes. They got into legalism. They got into keeping dietary laws. You can't eat this. You have to drain all the blood out of that, like we talked about Leviticus on Sunday morning. You have to make sure you uh, keep your hair a certain way. You got to make sure you do this, that, or the other, whatever the laws might have been. And taking away from the very simple and very free um, truth of the gospel message. It's not about what I can do for God. It's all about what He has already accomplished for me. And Abraham was given the Gospel. That's wild to think about. Because years and years and years and years later, Jesus Christ would come to the earth and walk on this earth as a man. Fully God and fully man, which is the Gospel. And yet, before Jesus Christ came physically on the earth, Abraham was saved. Abraham was made righteous. This is why the Old Testament becomes fascinating. Because the story is told in Genesis 22. If you haven't read Genesis 22, jot it down. Make sure you uh, commit that to uh, homework. Get, get to know what, what all these pictures are about. Genesis 22 is just one of the clearest pictures. Abraham is called to take his son. And here's the interesting thing about the Holy Spirit as the author of this book. It says, take now your son, your only son in whom you love. And by the way, it's the first time the word love is mentioned in the Bible, and that's significant. Anytime you see something in the Bible mentioned for the first time, take note. Because that's huge. And the per first time love is ever mentioned, it's in this story, G Genesis 22, of Abraham taking not in our sight, not by the flesh, his only son, because we've read the story. Good Bible students have. Did Abraham have one son? That was a question. He had two. He had two sons. Oh yeah, I forgot about Ishmael. The mistake, the one that Sarah had a bright idea. You know, I'm getting old, you're getting old, Abraham. Here, take this, my handmaid. And no argument from Abraham, by the way. All right, duh. <laughs> Goes that way. They, she she uh, gets pregnant. They have the first child is called Ishmael. Interesting, God does not even acknowledge that. Why? Because that whole thing with Sarah having the bright idea and, and saying to Abraham, we can get pregnant another way, was a work of the flesh. It was something we might do. Same kind of thing. Let's help God out. I think he's told us these, these promises, but in other words, I don't believe them. <laughs> I think we need to help him out a little bit. And the whole story is there for, for you and I to teach us what it means to believe. 
And God says now, take your son, your only son, Isaac, in whom you love, and kill him. Now, God has a problem. Because God told Abraham before making that declaration to take your son, your only son Isaac, and kill him on the mount, sacrifice him on the mount. God has a problem because he had told Abraham through your seed, that is Isaac, <laughs> the promised son, all nations would be blessed. And so Abraham said, I believe you, and if he dies, that's your problem, God. <laughs> it's not mine. In other words, Abraham believed that Isaac could be raised from the dead. In fact, the book of Hebrews tells us that, if you think I'm just reaching. In Hebrews 11, it has the greatest commentary, what's called the Hall of Faith, better than any Hall of Fame anywhere where you have the stories of Abraham, of Sarah, of all that believed God, and all that came before, before. And we know how Abraham was not killed on that mount, and that God declared, I will provide myself a sacrifice. Interesting phraseology again. Not I will provide for myself, but rather I will provide myself the sacrifice. In other words, I myself will be the sacrifice. And on that same mount, thousands of years later, Jesus Christ would suffer and die on a cross. Again, all of these things is what Paul knew. And it's what we should be reminded of. Because it goes on. How in the mind of Abraham, the father, his son Isaac was dead. Guess how many days? three days in his mind because he was told and then they took the journey it was three days journey and in his mind he's going I've got to take him up that mountain I'm going to kill my son I told God I would obey I'm going to do and in my and in his mind his son is dead for three days and yet he's risen on the third day that's not all when they come down the mountain in Genesis 22, it says Abraham came and returned because there were two young men that traveled with them. And it says Abraham came down and returned to the two young men and they took their journey. They went their way. And people read that and they just assume, and rightfully, you assume Isaac's with them. And he was. But the text does not say that. And what's interesting is the question arises, where's Isaac? <laughs> Ever since he's been up on that mountain and suffered and died, <laughs> the typology again of Jesus Christ, the next time you see Isaac's name, his person that's mentioned in the Bible <laughs> in Genesis, he's seen being introduced to his bride. And they come together beautifully. When Jesus went, last time Jesus was seen, it was the cross, the scene, the ascension. When will he come again, we all say. <laughs> when he's united, when he finally comes to meet the bride. And that's without even getting into who Abraham's eldest servant, who's a picture, his name, we're given his name, Eliezer, which means comforter. And you see who introduces Isaac, Jesus, to his bride, Rebecca, or the church. He was the comforter, Eliezer, who introduced you to Jesus Christ. You thought it was some friend you had. It was the Holy Spirit, who's called the comforter. This stuff is fascinating. It's incredible when you really understand every name, every omission, everything that's not like Isaac's name not being mentioned for chapters has significance. 66 books written by 40 different authors. I, it takes much more faith to think that this was all a work of some human that put this all together. In fact, it's totally an impossibility. It's completely an impossibility. Um, and so Abraham being preached, um, and rather 
Abraham being shown the gospel, being given the promise, the same is given to you, to me, who believe, not who read their Bible seven times through, not who say the sinner's prayer. In fact, the only reason we're given the Ten Commandments, the only reason the law exists is to point you to Jesus Christ. This is why when I'm going through a book like, like Leviticus or when we're, we were looking at Exodus and the tabernacle, all of those things are so boring unless Christ is the center. Then it becomes exciting because it's what the, it was intended for. The scriptures tell us. The reason for all of these laws, the reason for all of this stuff that we go through and look at and study is to point you, is to point me to Jesus Christ. Because there is nothing apart from Him. There is no life. There is no goodness. There is no eternity. Talk about depression. Apart from Christ, it's just death. It's just sin and, and lawlessness and all kinds of bickering and arguing and debating and just uh, confusion. The enemy is the author of confusion. I love Galatians 3, 28. I like 23 too, but 28. Galatians 3, 28. I've always committed that to memory. I really have. Because there can be some are rich, some are poor, some are slaves, bondmen, some are free men. Some are male and some are female. But I love that we can all be one in Christ Jesus. We cannot be one under a certain president. We can never be one. We know this as a fact. We've been trying for centuries as Americans and before that they've been trying all over the world to fulfill to come up with this unity to to somehow really make it so that we all get along why can't we all just get along everyone you know remembers it's because there's no if you're, it's only those two important, most important words in the Bible, in the New Testament especially, in Christ. It's the only way someone could be made free. It's the only way that some people could be in the same room together. It's because it's in Christ. It really is incredible when you understand and stop and, and think it doesn't matter. And this was radical. It still is radical in many cultures. To say that male and female are the same? We're spoiled here in America because we've been, you know, for a long time now we've known that. And it's only because of Jesus Christ and His work that that is a thing today in America. People don't realize that. They want to say it's because of Hillary. No. It's because of the work of Jesus Christ. It really is. It's the founding fathers. It's what this nation was founded on came because of that. All the freedom that we enjoy, and it's being taken little by little. We learned, we, we just read that on Sunday night in, in Ecclesiastes. One fool can destroy in one minute centuries and centuries of building. One fool can come along and just... I watch my little four-year-old do that all the time with Josh's building structure. Just takes one little flick, everything comes crashing down. If that doesn't describe America, I don't know what does. But thinking that you and I can build something, or you and I can, can stack up all of our good deeds by keeping the law is just as, it, well, it's beyond foolish it's deadly and it will 
destroy you. In the end, it leads to destruction. That is why we have to be reminded we come week after week, minute by minute, we come back to understand it's all about Jesus. Everything He's done on the cross. It is finished. Truly, it is finished. There is nothing to be added to it. There's nothing to take away from it. Because people try to take away from it too. The bloodiness. They don't like talking about the blood. The blood. But it's all about, It's all because of the blood that we can be one in Christ. It's Nothing can be taken away. Nothing can be added to. That is what Christianity is. That's what it means to be a Christian. It's to be obsessed, really, with Jesus Christ and what He's done. And to kind of just be unimpressed with anything that man does. The work of man. The work of the flesh. It's, it's silly. It really is. In fact, the Isaiah takes it a step further. He says, it's not silly, it's filthy. And in fact, it's an ins the biggest insult you can do is think, I'm a pretty good person. And yet, we see that happening especially in the Christian church. It creeps in in all kinds of ways to say, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good. Down, deep down inside, I'm an okay guy. Are you kidding me? Show me in the Bible where it says that. Because where I read, it says the heart is deceitfully, it's deceitful and it's desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, I alone, saith the Lord, test and try the heart. No one else, they can pretend to know it, but it's deadly, it's wicked. In fact, only one thing can repair the heart. The, the problem that we've had from the beginning, and that's sin. Again, it's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. Nothing more, nothing less. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground. But I paid for that class. All other ground. But I gave money to make sure I was a member all other ground but i was baptized by that guy that all other ground the only thing that we should stand on is christ and the finished work of jesus father thank you for your work on the cross how it is finished and lord that we don't need to add anything to it in fact if we try or attempt to add anything it ends up being 